We're back with Orion Samuelson. Orion, I think I'd like to change gears, and I know you're going to have some opinions about this subject area. Um, I'm putting it under the big rubric of pollution, environment, and agriculture. And uh, let's start with a quote. And again, your, your Samuelson Says articles have been just wonderful for this. Um, here's a one from May of 2008. For the past 60 years, and this is somebody else you're quoting, for the past 60 years, animal agriculture has been devastating our country's vital natural resources, including soil, water, and wildlife habitats. Okay, well, that's a good start. Yep. It has been generating more greenhouse gases than transportation. It has been elevating the risk of chronic disease that accounts for 130 million deaths annually. And it's been abusing billions of innocent animals. And then for the final line you mentioned, or you quoted, the only long-term solution to this tragedy is to gradually reduce the consumption of animal products to zero. Who's the quote from? Oh, gosh, now you can put me on the spot here. Um, you're quote, this is, you're quoting somebody else. Right. Indianapolis Star newspaper. Oh, that's right. I remember that story, yeah, that... Uh, was written by a, uh, a lover of PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. In agriculture, we call PETA People for the uh, 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 Tasty Eating of Animals. <laughs> <laughs> just to rub it in their face? Yeah. They irritate me. They just irritate me a lot because they're, uh, you talk about sound science, it disappears totally. Their, their arguments are all emotional. Well, let's start with the argument about greenhouse gases. I'm not enough of a scientist to know, but uh, you know, I'm I'm still bothered by by global climate change and warming. I uh, yeah, I'm sure there's some change, but I don't know that it's as serious as a lot of people are saying. And the reason I say that, we're measuring the current global warming based on 100 years or 200 years. That's that's minuscule in the history of the planet. 30,000 years ago, the Ice Age in North America started. 20,000 years ago, it was at its peak. And 10,000 years ago, it was gone. So that's a 30,000-year period that we we're measuring a weather trend. Now we're trying to do it in 200 years. And uh, I, just, I just find it strange that that beloved cow gets blamed for greenhouse gases that uh, amount to more than than transportation. Well, uh, we need to be mind. explicit in here, and there's no flatulence. <laughs> there you go. Methane. We're now turning methane from livestock into power. You know, we we have farms that now take the methane, and we have methane digesters on dairy farms, and I think we're going to see more of them. And it takes that livestock waste material and turns it into energy. That is another means, hopefully, of uh, depending less on foreign energy. But I, I'm not a scientist, and so I suppose here I, ask, I act emotionally. We've had animals on this planet forever, and uh, why are they now suddenly being blamed for all the ills of the planet and the environment? And, Global warming and greenhouse gases, and particularly uh, those uh, flatulence and uh, burping and belching uh, claims that uh, are destroying the atmosphere. Um, I got to ask you, and I think this is a peculiar question to ask, but what would your father say about this particular argument? <laughs> I think my father would just shake his head. Uh, I, I don't think he'd even laugh. He didn't have much of a sense of humor. I don't think he'd laugh, but he'd just shake his head and say, who are these people? What, what are they trying to do? Well, I suppose we're trying to eliminate all animals from the planet, is what it looks like. And I'm not sure that's a good balance. Because if you look at the goals of PETA, they want to end uh, animal agriculture. Uh, no more rodeos, no more zoos. Um, no more anything that they, in their definition, say treats animals inhumanely. Well, if you're going to do that, uh, then you turn everybody into vegetarians, and they say that that would be easier on the planet, but what do you do then with a million acres of grass 
that only a ruminant animal can turn into an edible food. Humans can't eat the grass, and um, the, uh, the animals that do consume it and do use it would be gone if they had their way. I don't buy that. I think everything is well, here for a reason. Well, I assume that they are okay with animal, wild animals who are living you know, on their own, living in nature. But domestic animals, they, I don't think, are. Mm -hmm. And so I've always, uh, when, I, when I chide the PETA people, I always say, hey, if you have a dog, turn it loose. God never intended a German shepherd to live on the 34th floor of a high-rise in Chicago. If you have a cat, turn it loose, because God never intended it should live in the house. Do I mean, you, if you're going to carry it that far, then I'll get just as emotional and carry it that way, too. Do you have... Uh PETA members, supporter who listen to your program? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. I hear from them. And what's the essence of uh, the comments you hear from them? Well, then I'm being totally unreasonable that dogs and cats don't add to the greenhouse gases and, uh, and they don't uh, get treated poorly. And, uh, that, uh, and, of course, I come back and say, you know, when God put dogs here, he probably didn't intend that they should live indoors. On the farm, our dog never came in the house. The dog always was outside living in the barn or wherever and uh, uh, it, it, it gets so out of, uh, out of context. I, I remember a letter exchange that I had with a, uh, a Peter person up in Wisconsin many years ago who uh, had written to me saying that we had to do away with what they called factory farms. Uh, to me, a factory has an assembly line with workers on the assembly line, so I don't think a farm is a factory. The, uh, the, the letter writer said, you know, this is terrible. It's inhumane. You shouldn't confine animals that way, and they should be out under uh, blue sky and walking on green grass. <clears throat> and then uh, that winter, I got a letter from uh, another person saying, I just drove up for a ski weekend in Wisconsin, and I drove by this farm, and they had those animals outside in the snow and the cold weather. you got to get those people to put those animals indoors. So I use the two letters. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to win, though. No, you're not going to win. Um, and to a certain extent, um, the, the um, camel's nose is in the tent because there's talk right now. And since EPA has declared that carbon dioxide is a pollutant, um, then there is now a discussion about taxing mm -hmm. animal emissions. Yes. Some unbelievable numbers. And again, all of these moves have the tendency to uh, bring an end to this kind of production. And for those of us who want to keep eating meat and drinking milk, that means that if we make it tough enough for farmers in this country to produce, uh, economically it won't make sense, and they'll just say, Hey, that's it. I've had it. Where is the tax that they propose supposed to be levied in this process? It would be levied every year. It would be an annual tax levied on the farm or the ranch. And I think uh, the figures I saw, something like uh, $75 for a dairy animal or a beef animal. Well, if you've got 1,000 animals, multiply $75 every year. Why, why feed animals then? I mean, because that probably would be your profit in a normal market. Uh, now, I've not heard anybody say, well, we're, we're serious about that. But the fact that somebody has come up with the numbers says that, yes, there is the discussion and that uh, we may have to go this way. It would put, uh, it was talked about at the Cattlemen's Convention, and, uh, and they said it would probably put 30% of the cattle people out of business. They couldn't afford it. Mm hmm would it drive some of the market overseas? So oh, if we want to eat beef, absolutely. We'd import it from Australia. We would import it from South America, where we have no control over how the animal is cared for, how the animal is fed. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if, uh, that's why I keep saying to consumers who pass laws like they did in California, where now, uh, within the next five years, poultry producers, hog producers, not that there are that many in California, but egg producers there are. And uh, they've got five years to totally change the building and the structure and the setup, mm -hmm. and the cost will be prohibitive. Uh, can you talk about that in some 
some more detail here. I think you're referring to Proposition 2, so it's not just a matter of law. It's a matter of, uh, you know, the entire population of California voted for this, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And again, because uh, they played to the emotion uh, of people. So what will probably happen to the consumers of California is their egg supply will, will leave the state and it'll be produced elsewhere, which means that their eggs will cost more and uh, the freshness won't be there the way it is, uh, you know, when it's produced in California. That's more than likely going to be the happening. What's the goal then for those who are advocating for things like Proposition 2? What do you see the long-term goals that they have? A lot of it is to get rid of animal agriculture. Uh, I, I keep coming back to that, uh, that uh, there are uh, very strong movements in the Humane Society of the United States and in the uh, People for Ethical Treatment of Animals. And um, and they want to eliminate animal agriculture. What would they the want you and me eating cereals. That? You know, not just California, but I would assume they want to extend that to other country or other well, states. Well, and and it's fully expected. Uh, there's a saying in agriculture that a rule that's uh, made in California eventually will make its way across the country. And um, uh, two or three years ago, there were propositions in Florida and Arizona that dictated the size of uh, crates for sows in gestation. That would again totally, these rules are made by people who have never fed a chicken or have never fed a hog. They, they don't know about the treatment that's there now. The, the dairy cows and the dairy calves that I see on farms today are treated so much better than they were on the farm where I grew up because the facilities are better, the ability to keep the pens and the animals clean far greater than when I was growing up. And we have done a lot to improve the quality of life. Now keep in mind, ultimately the animal will be slaughtered. That's part of what broiler chickens and hogs and cattle are all about. Uh, so it, it, it's again a frustrating issue. But if we make the rules tough enough and expensive enough, then we'll look to other countries for our food supply. And that bothers me. Is there a, a trend in the American population uh, towards more and more vegetarians to a less consumption of meat? I don't know. Um, probably there is more uh, because I think some of the campaigns of PETA do work. They have a great way of getting attention. And uh, even though most of it is emotional without, without a lot of fact behind it. So... Yeah, there probably is that trend um, because of the emotional argument. Mm -hmm. I uh, had an opportunity to interview Doug Parrott, who is a professor at the University of Illinois in right. Animal Sciences. Mm -hmm. um, he made the comment that Americans don't know where their food's coming from. And I, we got to that comment because he was using the word harvest instead of slaughtering and, and uh, butchering. Right. Uh, your reaction to that trend? Well, I think it has to be done because of the, the uh, emotional reaction and response you get to the word slaughtering. And so we harvest corn, we harvest soybeans, we harvest cattle, we harvest hogs. And uh, that's fine with me to use that, uh, that terminology, mm -hmm. no problem. Um, NIMBY, not in my backyard. <laughs> and how that plays out in agricultural communities. Uh, it plays out in the building of ethanol plants. Uh, it plays out in the building of wind farms. It, uh, it plays out in so many areas. I guess probably my Samuelson says uh, this issue deals more with energy uh, because in the community where I grew up, uh, a company is trying to put in a wind farm and uh, put wind turbines in. Uh, and... Uh, that area is uh, relatively poor economy-wise from an agricultural standpoint. It's hilly and, uh, and, you know, no big farming operations there, and uh, it's, it's not a financially strong community. Well, a wind farm uh, would allow at least an additional two to $3,000 a year to the farmer where that turbine is placed. But two families from Chicago moved up there in retirement to uh, 
have their retirement home up there on, on one of the hills or in one of the valleys. And immediately, we don't want that wind farm spoiling our view. Uh, wind uh, turbines are dangerous. Uh, in the wintertime, they'll get ice on the blades, and the ice will come flying off and kill people. And there's a strobe light effect that will affect people mentally, and it'll kill birds, and all of these emotional arguments that have not proven true in any of the wind farms that uh, have been constructed across the country. And so it comes back, we all want clean energy, we all want cheap energy, but not in my backyard. And um, it's been in litigation for three years, and I think the company is about ready to give up. And it has split the community, it has split families, <laughs> because uh, <clears throat> it would be an income producer for a lot of farmers, uh, but others have been uh, enthralled by the two families from Chicago and say, oh, they're right, man, that wouldn't look good with a tower up there on the hill. And so I think that they'll, they'll probably just give up and walk away. Uh, it's already happened on another proposed wind farm north of Milwaukee, where, mm -hmm. again, the opposition was, no, no, we don't want it there. Well, look at Cape Cod. They want to put it out in the water at Cape Cod, and the Kennedys say, well, oh, no, it'll spoil our view of the ocean. Well, then we continue to buy oil from the Middle East. And so uh, an ethanol plant in Wisconsin, again, uh, the challenge here is retired people move out from the city, and they don't want anything to change. They don't have to make a living in the community because they've got their retirement fund. But the people who live there, Clinton, Wisconsin, just north of the Illinois border, they tried to put an ethanol plant in there. Some retired professors from the University of Wisconsin had moved out there. No, we don't want an ethanol plant here. It'll put pollutants in the air and uh, organized the community and fought it, and the plant was never built. In light of the economy now, maybe that was a good mm -hmm. move. but. Uh, uh, well, another one to get any closer to, uh, even closer to agriculture, is hog confinement facilities. That's a hot button subject. Anytime one is proposed, and a, and a major expansion of a hog operation in the in the country, in in Illinois, for example, and dairy in Illinois, we have a, a big fight going on in Joe Davies County, Illinois. A dairyman who wants to build a forty five hundred cow uh, facility there, and has been fought every step of the way. Uh, mainly by non-farmers, but even some farmers who are saying, hey, we don't want that. And, and I don't understand because they do provide a good market for farmers who grow hay, corn, oats, soybeans, because they have to feed those animals. Um, the dairyman who's trying to do that is a very successful dairyman with operations in California and in Oregon and has a good record of running a good dairy farm operation. Uh, and probably uh, would question his wisdom in trying to build this in an area where a lot of Chicago people have moved out to summer homes. Um, probably should have gone downstate somewhere far away from any kind of retirement community and any kind of, a, of an urban community and, and tried to do it there. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, he's still fighting it and fighting it in the courts and he may win uh, last I heard, uh, some of the farmers have come around, but uh, the non-farmers are saying. No. What's your comment, though, when it goes beyond the aesthetic argument, so it's just, we're out here, we want to retire, we don't want these things around us, to issues like water quality and, mm -hmm. and uh, how you manage that massive amount of manure that's being produced. Well, the way the, uh, we have a relatively new livestock siting law in Illinois that deals with this issue and sets up the parameters on how uh, on the facility you build to handle the manure and uh, the procedures you use. And, and farmers understand that. They want to be good neighbors. Uh, and in many cases, they're there long before the non-farmers decide they want a five-acre plot with a home on it. Uh, and... Uh, I I fault a lot of realtors who entice city people to go out to the country uh, and not explaining to them that they're going to smell things they've never smelled before and they're going to hear noises they've never heard before and that uh, the electricity could go out during a thunderstorm and there's not weekly garbage pickup and all that. And I really think that uh, realtors who sell home sites to people from the city 
should do a far better job of saying, okay, there's a dairy farm about three miles from you, there's a hog farm about two miles from you, and they have certain rights on what they're going to do with uh, their livestock operations. Uh, and the industry itself really has to continue, and, and here we come to check off dollars in the pork industry. A lot of check off dollars are being spent on odor control, and we're making headway on it where we're able to uh, really reduce odors. Because on a hot summer day, a hog farm can have an odor that you really don't want, and I understand you want to live next to that. But if you knew before you got there that this was there, then maybe you would tend to locate your home somewhere else. Um, uh, but farmers want to be good neighbors, and and they work very hard, and, and I, I I remember years ago when you'd move into a community and there'd be a welcome wagon and you know they'd come out and they'd give you certificates from stores and tell you where the post office is and the hospital and all that. And I suggest to county farm bureaus they ought to have a welcome wagon in the country. And instead of, uh, of uh, shunning a city neighbor who moves out there, be there at the door with an apple pie the day they arrive and they move in and explain to them what's going to be happening around them. Because if you get them to understand right away, then they can become advocates. But if you just turn your back on them, then they feel unwanted, and pretty soon they're filing lawsuits saying, you know, you can't do that here. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, yeah, this whole NIMBY thing is, is a problem. Really um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the dynamics of how these decisions are made for approval of some of these things like an ethanol plant or a hog confinement facility or this dairy operation. And the dynamic is whether or not these decisions are centralized, stay at the state level versus at the county or even more locally, how that plays out. <coughs> well, the Illinois law is a state law and uh, designed to keep it uniform all across the state. Uh, and Iowa did a similar law, but uh, they ran into a real hornet's nest from counties who said, no, we ought to have the, the final say on you know what's going into the county. Um, I prefer the state way. I think that you have to have it uniform across the state. Uh, if you're going to do it on a county-by-county -county basis, um, then you'll probably just drive it into the next county or whatever. The, uh, drive it out of the state then, most likely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, uh, as a matter of fact, the citing law that the legislature uh, worked out in Illinois has uh, been a model for other states to, uh, to do pretty much the same thing. The parameters that are established on how close you could be to a community and, uh, and how do you handle the runoff and how do you handle the waste and how do you work the odor and all that sort of thing. And, and I think it's a pretty good law, but again, lawsuits are filed and it drags out for years and finally the farmer runs out of money and says, you know, I can't, can't afford to fight this any longer. Well, that brings us to the, the role then that the courts and uh, lawyers are playing in a lot of these processes now. Perhaps 50 years ago, lawyer, or Farmers would have never dreamed that they would have to get involved with the, the judicial system as much. When young people who come off the farm to go to college to the University of Illinois uh, say to me, well, you know, what kind of a career uh, should I take? I say I have two suggestions. Number one, international marketing. Learn languages, not only how to speak them, but how to write them and read them. And number two, become an environmental lawyer because farmers are going to be sued forever. And we need attorneys with a farm background and an understanding of production agriculture uh, to be there to defend the producer side of environmental law and arguments. Uh, and uh, probably, in my opinion, the best environmental lawyer in the country today is Gary Bays, who has an Illinois farm. He's based in Washington, and he gets involved in many of the environmental lawsuits that, uh, that come up. And... Uh, he wins quite a few of them, not all of them. Mm -hmm. But we need environmental lawyers uh, because there are enough on the other side who say, you know, I... I was going to say, where are the trend lines? Uh, who seems to be winning most of the legal arguments right now? Uh, a lot of them get dragged out to the point where a farmer will give up 
and you know just like the wind turbine farm up in my part of Wisconsin mm -hmm. uh, the legal fees get to the point where you can't afford to do it um, the important ones that I think Gary has won he won uh, uh, dust pollution in uh, Washington State that was a major one where they were going to prohibit burning uh, when you produce seed grass seed and that sort of thing you need to burn uh, and he, find, he won that case uh, where they get permission to uh, still can burn. Uh, he's currently involved in a couple of uh, swine farm cases in Illinois. Uh, been dragging on for four or five years, and uh, I, I don't know how close they are to resolution. But it, it's expensive. So and the lawyers on both sides of the argument are winning out, but... Well, that's the way it always is in lawsuits. The attorneys win. I don't know if the plaintiffs or the defendants ever win. <laughs> um, another shift of gears, but a minor one here. Uh, there has been increasing discussion, dialogue in the United States about our obese population, mm -hmm. and it's translated into interesting things like, well, banning fast food restaurants in places like San Francisco. I don't know if they've been successful to do that, but at least there's a dialogue about that. Um, your, your reaction to that whole debate? Very quick. I am so tired of people running off to Washington to pass legislation to protect ourselves from ourselves. I'm just fed up with it. If we as individuals don't have the sense and the responsibility to conduct ourselves, why should we go to Washington and say, okay, take the temptation away from me because I can't. So close McDonald's and close Burger King. And I get equally irritated by the reference to these uh, restaurants serving junk food. There is no junk food in my opinion and uh, I'm not alone in that. I spoke recently to the National Convention of the School Nutrition Association. These are the hot lunch people in schools across the country and I told them that I, I have my own one person campaign to do away with the phrase junk food because I said to a starving child in Nigeria, a Big Mac is not junk food. And uh, boy, a lot of them came up and agreed with me that, you know, it's bad terminology. And of course, they're working to improve the, uh, the education, the nutrition education with uh, the people who eat school lunches. And uh, so they're deeply involved in, in fighting the obesity issue. But it, it comes down to to parents and individuals making decisions. And this idea of running off to Washington to get a law that will protect ourselves from ourselves, I've had it up to here with that. Uh, I, I assume you're familiar with uh, documentary King Corn, I believe was the name of it. These, these yeah, yeah, I watched a little bit of it. And said, basically, uh, uh, their argument was that there are so many things in our food supply now that derived from corn or corn bry products that mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the huge reasons we are an obese population. Yeah, they're blaming the high fructose corn sweetener that's used in most of the soda pops today. They're blaming uh, and now another charge to do away with the corn people is uh, we're finding mercury now in corn syrup and uh, so that's uh, that's something else to be concerned about. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, aware of that and Story that I use, um, my dad ate all of the wrong foods all of his life, working on a farm. I mean, breakfast was bacon and eggs, and uh, at uh, lunch it was uh, dinner. Uh, for us, it was fried meat and potatoes and gravy and bread and butter and cheese. And, and for supper, before we'd go out and milk the cows, it was the leftovers from noon, and then he'd always have to have a bowl of ice cream before he went to bed. Uh, in other words, ate all of the foods that today they say will kill you. And the people who say that are right. It killed my dad at age 95. <laughs> all of these foods that he ate that are so bad for you. Uh, and, and to me, to, to come up with a blanket diet for the population of the United States is ridiculous because uh, my makeup is different than yours my body reacts to things differently than yours do. We have an engineer here at WGN who constantly eating and uh, he probably weighs 130 pounds but he's forever eating and uh, you know his metabolism is a lot different than mine 
I suspect also that your father had uh, other ch differences in his lifestyle than a lot of the people who are working in cubicles here. Yeah, no question about that. And I, uh, but I use it to make my point. But uh, because he was active every day, he was physically active and working hard every day. And uh, uh, but uh, you know, all these foods that kill you, and it did at age ninety-five. But my mother, who did the cooking, uh, killed her at eighty-nine. So. <laughs> So you're lucky in that respect. Yes, I am. I really am. Yeah. Um, one other thing in the in the environmental area, if you will, and that's infrastructure development. Things like the waterways, railroad networks, uh, water policy issues, things like that. If you can address those things. Infrastructure infrastructure is a major concern, particularly roadways and bridges, um, because today when we move uh, grain to market and when we move livestock to market, we have some heavy, heavy truckloads. And uh, I think one of the real concerns is, uh, and it's been addressed by the legislature, or well, talked about, and certainly not solved because it takes money, is the bridge situation in Illinois that simply cannot handle a, a load of semi-load of grain or, or livestock. That infrastructure, I think, is badly in need of, of correction. Uh, looking at infrastructure that is not there, uh, broadband. I mean, if you're a student in a rural school, you are at a disadvantage because very often you don't have the ability to get on the Internet. Um, and several years ago, there was a move in Illinois uh, to to get that done, and now it's being talked about again that we we do need to. Uh, well, I think uh, President Obama is talking about the uh, need for internet broadband across uh, the entire nation. Um, how much money that'll take, I'm not sure, but this is an infrastructure that has not been built in many cases, and I think needs to be built. Uh, railroads um, play a more important role in moving grain, and, and the railroads have done a much better job uh, in moving agricultural products because I remember 20 or 30 years ago, every year at harvest time, we'd be doing stories on where are the grain cars? They're not available. We're piling grain on the ground because we can't get railroad cars in there, and why isn't the railroad mm -hmm. building more of them? Uh, we don't do that anymore. Uh, maybe because we have more elevator facility in, in rural communities, but I think the railroads have done a pretty good job. Well, I, to, to be more explicit on that one, uh, I know the Burlington Northern Santa Fe here just a few years ago, 2003-2004, has built a series of rail terminals right. next to grain, massive grain elevators, right. and as I understand it, they're shipping 110 carloads of grain out once a week from some of these places. Yeah. Unit trains is what they call them, and uh, it has dramatically changed the uh, ability to move grain because in Illinois, you either get them to the river and get the grain to the river and put it on barges down to New Orleans to the port, or you put it on trucks, or the best way to do it probably is on, on rail. And uh, in Illinois, most of it goes south. Some of it goes to the St. Lawrence Seaway east. Uh, if you live up in uh, in North Dakota, Minnesota, a lot of that is railed to the port of Duluth, and it goes out to St. Lawrence, and then the rest of it goes to Portland mm -hmm. and Seattle, but primarily Portland as a uh, uh, a main source. And these 100 unit, uh, 110 unit car trains, have made a big difference for the railroads because they're assured now that they've got the uh, commodity to fill the train and. The elevators and the farmers know that uh, they've got this uh, this commitment to uh, to load the train. Uh, the most interesting one I have found takes me back to Maricopa, Arizona, where they have built <coughs> this uh, ethanol plant, and it's right next to a 200,000 head cattle feedlot, and involved in the whole complex is a feed manufacturing plant that makes uh, dairy feed for 80 percent of the dairy cows in Arizona. It's a farmer cooperative, Arizona Grain Company, and uh, visited that uh, in 2008. And twice a week, they bring in a 110-unit uh, train of corn from Iowa, Minnesota, Nebraska. And that train comes in and is unloaded in six hours, and then turns around and uh, and they you know they try to send stuff back on the train, but that's not always possible. 
but twice a week they're getting 220 carloads of corn from the Midwest. Um, now, for feeding the livestock and for making feed, yeah, that works. But the question that I ask, does it make sense to truck ethanol out here, or does it make more sense to truck the corn out here and turn it into ethanol? And they said, well, that question will be answered over the next two years. They think so. They think that the study they did says, yes, it makes more sense uh, because they use the corn for a lot of other stuff. And so, This whole dialogue um, gets us to the issue of economies of scale in mm -hmm. agriculture as well. Yeah. And you quickly, he says, if you're talking about that massive amount of movement and production, you're not talking about the small-scale farmer being able to be successful in that kind of environment, are you? Unless it's a niche uh, product that uh, the farmer is involved in, if it's organic, why well, then a smaller farmer can make it. Um, a lot of farmers close to urban areas go to roadside marketing and farm market stands. And uh, uh, I know a 17-year-old uh, young man who has developed a tremendous market in Chicago for dill that uh, he grows on his grandfather's farm and uh, trucks it into the uh, produce market in Chicago three days a week and has developed a great market in three years. So, the, you know, there is, uh, if, if you're a good manager and you're innovative and you think out of the box, you can find a way for the smaller farm to make it. But if you're going to be a grain farmer, uh, the cost of a combine and a tractor today says you've got to have more than 200 acres because you can't afford to get the equipment that will do what you need it to do if you have 200 acres. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think, as I said earlier, the family farm certainly hasn't died, but oh, what a change from the 200-acre family farm that lives up here with me. That farm is gone. And uh, in today's uh, economy, and, and I, I don't get into the social issue here, is it good or bad, but the reality of it all is that it's, it's the direction that we're going. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't see it reversing. Um, I assume you have some nostalgia for that small family farm of 200 acres? Oh, I do, yes. And, uh, you know, the farm, the, the house where I was born is still there. Uh, the barn that I helped my dad build is still there, but we were milking 30 cows, they're milking 180, and uh, they have, two brothers purchased four farm, three farms, plus the one they were living on next to ours, mm -hmm. so four farms uh, is now one family farm, still a family, but uh, yeah, totally mm -hmm. different. Um, getting back to the marketing side here again, I've, I've had an opportunity to visit one of these uh, unit train Right. terminals mm -hmm. and the the part that my brain had a difficult time wrapping around was okay here this terminal operator was Jay Johnson in this case down in Waverly Illinois okay who has to guarantee that he can fill up that train right. every week yep. throughout the entire year and knowing full well that you know there's about two months in the fall when all of this grain is produced um, how are they managing that, both the farmers and the terminal operators, and maybe this gets us back to the, the border trade and things like that? Well, they're managing it because there's a lot more on-farm storage than there was, and so, you know, when they harvest, they're able to store a lot of it on the farm. Uh, I don't know what this, uh, what this elevator has in, the, uh, in grain capacity, but it's contracting uh, with the grower. Uh, whether uh, you're doing it on a forward contract where in the spring the grower will say, okay, I'm going to produce in normal weather this many bushels and uh, I'll guarantee delivery to you. Now you tell me what the price is going to be. If it is uh, not a forward contract but based on um, buying it out of the field at harvest time, uh, then that grain elevator, that terminal elevator, if I bring in a load of corn and he pays me four dollars a bushel for that corn then he's got this risk sitting out there so before the trading day at the Board of Trade ends he's on the phone to his broker at the Board of Trade saying okay I've got this corn and I want you to sell it at this price uh, that, he, that he really bought it at and then that's his hedge 
uh, he has protected himself then in the futures market in case the market goes against him. He paid $4 uh, to buy the corn, and then the next day it goes down to uh, $3 in the cash market. But he has already gone in and sold it at $4 in the futures market. Now, the problem that you have with that is this thing called basis, where the basis price on the river could be 20 to 30 cents off from the futures price at the Board of Trade. And so we have developed an options market now. You can sell, you can trade puts and calls. And this is why I have maintained uh, for quite a while that American farmers are just super at producing but they're not super at marketing. And part of the reason is it's gotten very complicated. That's why I'm glad to see these young people going off to college and coming back to the farm because they, they develop the knowledge so that they can really protect themselves in the marketplace much better than the method that I've seen all too often where you know I've, I've talked to corn farmers and they say, boy, when corn gets to $3 a bushel, I'm selling it. Well, the, corn will get to $3 and uh, $3.10. So I'll call him up and I'll say, hey, congratulations, you got your $3. And he says, oh, I didn't sell it. <laughs> and I know what the next line is, you know, why did you sell it? Well, it's going to go to $4. Uh, and, uh, and farmers rarely sell on an up market, but boy, do they ever sell on a down market because they keep thinking it's going to go up, and if it goes up another 10 cents, I've lost the 10 cents. That's why I say you've got to know your cost of production, and then you've got to determine what will be enough profit for you in the marketplace to cover the cost of production and give you a profit. And then you put your, your order in to sell at that level, and when it gets there, have the discipline to sell it. And um, it gets there. And now they're no longer a hedger, they're a speculator because, oh, it's going my way, I'll ride with it up. And uh, then two days later, the market will start to go down. And they'll think, well, I'm still right. You know, it'll come back tomorrow. And then the second day, it goes down again. And by the third day now, you're nervous and you start selling and everybody else in that same boat starts selling and it just, you know, down, down, down. Uh, to me, discipline in the marketplace is critical. I have a son who's a member of the Board of Trade, and he's a pure speculator. He goes in with his uh, investment every day and puts it on the line as a speculator, providing liquidity for the market. And when he told me he was going to go in to grain trading when he came out of college because he'd had a job as a runner and a clerk on the floor at the board in the Merck, and he said, I'm going to be a trader, Dad. And I said, no, you're not. No, you're not. I said, since 1960, I've seen too many friends uh, who develop ulcers, become alcoholics, or die of heart attacks. I said, David, you have not got the discipline to be a trader. Don't do it. Well, he did, and I take credit for his success because I told him he couldn't. He has. <laughs> he had to prove you wrong. He had to prove me wrong, and, uh, and his discipline is, is astounding. If he gets into a, into a market position and uh, he sees the signs that's going against him, he's out. So he'll take a small loss, but get out before it becomes a big loss. And if it starts going his way, he has already determined what level he wants to see. And if it gets close to that level, he takes it. Mm -hmm. And it's too bad that farmers can't do it because they have an advantage over him. They have the product. He does all he's got is a piece of paper that says he's long wheat or he's short wheat. And uh, uh, I, it's getting better. And interestingly enough, I'm finding more farm wives doing the marketing. And, uh, <laughs> and as I, I like to say in my speeches, I know why. Because you guys sit in the combine, you see that corn and soybeans coming out into the wagon, and you think, man, that's the prettiest stuff I've ever grown. I love it. And you don't want to sell it. But when Mama knows there's a bill to pay or a uh, pickup to buy, she sells it. And uh, I talk often about a couple up in northern Illinois who are friends of mine. They milk 250 cows, and they grow 1,500 acres of cash corn and soybeans. And she does all the marketing. And every day she sits on that computer for probably for an hour. And here's what separates her from a lot of producers. 
Her goal is not to sell at the top of the market. Her goal is at the end of the market year to have sold everything in the top third of the market. And her husband says she's done it for seven years. And he's as proud as you could be. Oh, this one. because financially it's, you know, it's made a tremendous difference. She markets milk in the futures market, and then uh, she sells uh, the grain. There was a, a trader on the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade, Uncle Julius, a little Jewish fellow, pure speculator, made millions and lost millions. And when he died at age 84, he left uh, what was in his estate to pet hospitals because he didn't have children and his wife was, had passed on and he, uh, he had a pet dog and so that's where his money went. But I'd come down onto the trading floor and every time I'd come onto the trading floor, Uncle Julius would come up and he'd say, Orion, you gotta tell your farmers some things about how they market. I said, okay. And I heard this hundreds of times. He said, first of all, tell them to quit trying at the, to sell at the top of the market. Top is here and gone three weeks before you know it was the top. He said, secondly, if you think corn is going to $3, put your order in at two ninety seven, because everybody else will probably be at $3, and so the market will hit 3 and everybody sells, and it turns around and goes down. Leave a little for the other guy, and you'll go to the <laughs> bank. And then his third one that summed up the first two was, remember, in the market, there's always profit for the bulls, always profit for the bears, never any profit for the hogs. They get killed. <laughs> <laughs> Words to make a, a living by, right? <laughs> Absolutely, and he did. He really did. He was a delightful character. Um, I think you need to explain, at least to me, what liquidity means. Liquidity means having cash in the market. And there is a good example of that in the current economy. The, the banks, the financial institutions, don't have the cash on hand to fulfill the obligations of making loans or credit or that sort of thing. Uh, and so the liquidity is gone. The, the grain market, the CME group, has the liquidity that's provided by, by everybody in the market and speculators in particular. I mean, they, they put cash into that market every day, and that provides liquidity so that if there's somebody out there who wants to sell corn at $3 a bushel, there is a trader on the other side that has the liquidity, the cash, to take that uh, opposite position, and that's what makes a market. You, you can't have just sellers. You can't have just buyers. And you've got to have both sides of that market covered, and, and, and that's liquidity. And the thing that separates the CME group in Chicago from the New York Stock Exchange is the cash is there. It's in the bank. Uh, Wall Street, we have found out, it isn't there. Mm -hmm. Well, just listening to you talk about farmers and people at the Board of Trade, mm -hmm. um, beginning to think that maybe some of the best economists in the United States right now are those producers out there in those fields because their very life depends on guessing right. Yeah, it does. Um, but they don't always guess right uh, because they start out as hedgers to protect their crop and then it, uh, the hedge goes their way and they're making money and then they say, okay. But it's not just selling their crop from what you've explained before. They're also having to make decisions about when to buy the fertilizer and yep. whether or not to lock in a futures contract for their fuel and things like yep. that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not just, mar well, it's marketing on the sell side and on the buy side. And, uh, and volatility is good in the marketplace but you'd better be right in how you trade it. And unfortunately, uh, well, Vera Sun Energy, uh, making corn ethanol, uh, 14, 15, 16 plants, uh, declared bankruptcy because last summer uh, they needed corn to run the plants and they saw corn going to $7 a bushel and they thought, oh my God, if oil keeps going up, then everything else is gonna go up and uh, we don't see oil turning around, so that means, and there was, there were economists saying corn would hit $10 a bushel. And so the people at Virasun took a look at that and they said, we better, we better buy the corn we need in November and December and January right now, because it's gonna go higher and higher. So they did. 
And then by November, corn had fallen 50%. But they're still stuck with the purchase price up here. And contract says they will pay that. And then the price of ethanol dropped. And they were caught. Just like farmers who watched the oil price go up and saw nitrogen go over $1,000 a ton. And they were used to paying 400 a few years ago, $300. So they took a look at that. Oil is never going never gonna to get lower. So we better lock in our fertilizer price for next spring right now. So they locked it in at $1,000. And now cost of fertilizer is probably mm -hmm. down to five or six. What's the implications then when the, the price swings for these commodities are over this huge range versus 20 years ago when it was a much tighter range that they would, they would swing between? Uh, probably easier to trade then because you didn't have as much at risk. You know, if the market moves uh, three or five cents uh, on a contract of corn, that's $250. Uh, today on a contract of corn, if it moves 30 cents, which it can do, then you're looking at $1,500. And uh, so your exposure and your risk much greater today than it was back when we had those, ki those kinds of moves. And I can remember in the 60s where if corn moved two cents a bushel in a day, that was, mm -hmm. uh, that was a market. Uh, today it can... Uh, well, there are daily limits. It can only go so far up or down, but uh, uh, that's 30 cents a bushel on a, on a contract at uh, $50 a penny. That means 60 cents. So you can have a $3,000 price swing on one contract in one day. Do you see the, uh, the market settling down in the future? Uh, it'll never be what it was. Uh, and yeah, I think it will. It will settle down um, because there was a time we weren't even trading fundamentals. You know, we weren't trading supply, demand, weather. We're back to trading weather now on soybeans and corn to a certain extent, watching the weather in South America. So we are back to some fundamentals. But um, as I say, the, the trading uh, atmosphere has changed with the funds that are bundling commodities and tying corn to oil to copper uh, and using those in investment portfolios for investors like you and me if we're into a mutual fund. And, and that has totally changed the complexion of, uh, of the thinking uh, back in the 60s. Yeah, you looked at the users, you looked at the producers, and you looked at the weather, and you looked at supply and demand, and that's pretty much all you had to look at. Well, now, in the last six months, none of that has, has meant anything. And, and the fascinating thing is, with ethanol and biofuels, um, the price of oil has affected the price of corn and soybeans, mm -hmm. and particularly soybean oil, because that goes into a biofuel. And so if you're wondering which way the uh, soybean market's going, you look at the price of oil. Never had to do that before. <laughs> Let's uh, end this block of, di of discussion here with uh, taking us now to the issue of credit, the farmer and credit. Mm -hmm. And because that world has changed dramatically. Suddenly we're hearing that there is no liquidity in, the, in, in banks anymore as well. Right. But there is more liquidity in community banks and in rural banks than there are in the city groups and the J.P. Morgans and the rest of them. Uh, here's, let me phrase the question this way then. I hear all the time that farmers have to borrow money at the beginning of the season to purchase their fertilizer, to purchase their fuel. And I'm wondering, is that because they're leveraged themselves so much? Or are we talking about farmers who are still paying for purchasing land in the first place that don't own their land outright? Some of that is certainly the case, but it's been traditional if you're not a livestock operator, if you're just a grain farmer. <clears throat> it has been traditional that you borrow the money at planting time, that's your operation loan as it's called, and then at harvest time, uh, and generally when you borrow that money, you've got to present a selling plan to the bank who's going to give you that loan. So they have an idea, and, and some banks now will insist that you go in and hedge that, that price. 
as soon as you can so that uh, you're not going to get knocked out of the loan if the market just falls apart. So the rules have changed from the standpoint of protection in, in the futures market or the options market. Uh, if you're in the livestock business, then it's totally different. Then you probably, uh, the timing isn't all that critical, but during the year you do have to have operating expenses. And, and you do operate on credit. Um, if your farm is paid for, you're in a much better position. Uh, the bank likes that a lot because now you've got collateral. If your farm isn't paid for, then credit probably gets to be a little more difficult. But the thing in this current economy, this current turned out, I, I have spoken at meetings of two regional banks in Illinois in the last three months, uh, community banks with maybe nine or ten banks and another company with four or five banks. And uh, I always ask the bank president and the lending officer, how's your agricultural portfolio? And they say, very good, very good, because farmers have been able to make a profit. And then I say, what about your availability of credit for them? Uh, are you in the same situation as uh, my bank, which is Citibank? And they say, no, we didn't get into the subprime market. We didn't do the things that those big banks did. And so we pretty much stayed local with our investment and with our loans and our portfolio. And so we're not in the situation that they're in. So I said, maybe Citibank should come and take a look <laughs> at your operation and see what you're doing. And they said, you know, you lose customers by turning down loans at times. But in the long run, you're a lot more solid because you turned them down. Uh, and, and one president of the bank said, I'd much rather make a customer angry than have him get a loan and fail. And... Um, and in some cases, we refused the loan or we cut it in half. And the farmer survived. And had we not done that, he would have lost and we would have lost. Mm -hmm. So I think, in rural, and, and farm credit system is very strong, but because of the entire financial economy, they have had to tighten their loan requirements a little bit. But they're in much better shape than the big city banks. Okay. One other uh, question then in this area, um, and that's renting versus owning your own land. You know, that's interesting. It's an emotional argument because uh, back in the 80s when times were tough, I spoke at the Ohio Farm Bureau and uh, a young farmer came up to me and said, uh, you know, I'm doing okay because I am not going to buy this expensive land uh, I am not going to take on debt. I would rather use the money that I'd put into buying a farm into uh, doing a better job of farming. And, and so I, I want to rent. I do not want to own. I do not want to rent. All right, I, I, I want to rent because uh, putting all that money into land just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I'll use it to farm. There were two or three more mature farmers standing with an earshot and they heard the conversation and when it ended and he walked away they said that is so wrong if you don't own the farmland then you're not part of the community if you rent it you can walk away and so you don't care about investing in schools and you don't care about this if you don't own the land you're just that's wrong thinking so you have these two emotional sides going for you but uh, a lot of farmers have to rent today because non-farm investors own the land. Uh, a lot of investors finally realized, with the market doing what it's been doing in the uncertainty, finally realized that, hey, as Will Rogers said, they ain't making any more. And so uh, farmland uh, is, is not a spectacular investment, but it's a solid investment. And uh, so that means that uh, a lot of farmers have to rent. But that, that makes them very vulnerable in a time like uh, last year and this year because with the commodity prices going sharply higher, these landowners are saying, hey, you know, you may be my friend and you may have been farming my land for me for 20 years, but I've got to have, uh, have $200 an acre more because other people are here trying to 
to rent the land. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it does lead to some hard feelings. Has the uh, cost of an acre of, of prime farmland taken the same course as commodities? Uh, not to the extent of the ups and downs. Uh, we've seen a little drop off in farmland at the moment. Where we've seen the drop off in farmland value is development land. Uh, there are many farms around Chicago right now where stores uh, held options to buy the farmland and shopping center companies held options to buy the farmland. They've dropped them. Uh, and so the value of development farmland has dropped sharply. But production farmland, not a sharp drop. Okay. I'm going to end with a teaser for our next session and how we're going to start. I'd like to, next time we start, talk about taxes, inheritance law, and estate planning and see okay. what the reaction of those okay. are. Okay. Thank you, Orion. Mm -hmm.